Welcome to my channel, where the scariest stories come to life. Before we dive into today's chilling tale, make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications, so you never miss a story. Now, let's get into the horror. This happened when I was 8 years old. I had a friend named Max, and we often hung out at each other's houses. One Friday night, I was invited to sleep over at his house. Max's family had a pretty average house in a typical neighborhood. The living room was at the front, the kitchen was toward the back, and the bedrooms were upstairs. After school, I went to his house with my sleeping bag, toothbrush, and some other stuff. My mom planned to pick me up the next morning. When I arrived, we had pizza with his family and hung out later that evening. For some reason, we decided to sleep in the living room. Maybe it was because the TV was there, or perhaps there was just more space. Max and I set up our sleeping bags on the floor in the living room. Later, when it got late, his parents and sister went upstairs to bed. Max and I stayed up a little longer, but he got tired quickly and was soon asleep in his sleeping bag. I, on the other hand, wasn't tired. I lay down, got under the covers, and closed my eyes, but I just couldn't fall asleep. Without a phone or anything to keep me occupied, I was bored. I lay there in the dark, alternating between staring at the living room and trying to sleep. This went on for what felt like at least 30 minutes to an hour. The house was dark and completely silent. Then, out of nowhere, I heard the sound of the garage door opening, the one that led from the garage into the pantry next to the dining room. The sound startled me. For a moment, I thought it might be Max's dad, but I had seen everyone go upstairs earlier. The living room was closed off from that part of the house, so I couldn't see the garage door. To see it, you'd have to go around a corner into the kitchen, where you'd then get a view of the dining room and pantry. I could only see a small part of the kitchen, and it was in the opposite direction. After the door opened, I heard faint footsteps, but then everything went silent again. I started to feel nervous, wondering if it might be an intruder. I expected whoever it was to either walk into the living room or go upstairs, which would mean passing by me. I lay completely still in my sleeping bag, staring at the corner where someone might appear. But no one came, and I didn't hear anything else. I lay there for what felt like 10 or 15 minutes, wide awake and unsure of what to do. Finally, I decided to wake Max. I tapped his shoulder a few times until he stirred. When he asked what was going on, I whispered that I'd heard the garage door open and thought someone had entered. At first, he thought I was joking, but when I insisted, he woke up fully. We whispered about it for a few moments, before deciding to check. Nervously, we got up and walked toward the kitchen. Just as we were about to reach the entrance, we heard the garage door open again. Peeking around the corner, we saw the door closing and someone walking out into the garage. We didn't get a good look at the person, but it was clear that someone had been inside. Max ran to the door and locked it before sprinting back to the living room. He said he was going to wake his parents. I waited in the living room while Max ran upstairs and returned with his parents. His dad went into the garage to check while we explained what had happened to his mom. A few minutes later, Max's dad came back and said that whoever had been there was gone. He even checked the backyard but didn't see anyone. Afterward, his parents went back upstairs, and Max and I returned to our sleeping bags. Max fell asleep quickly, but I couldn't. I stayed awake for at least another 30 minutes. Eventually, I started to relax and feel a bit sleepy. Just as I was about to drift off, I heard the garage doorknob turn. Since the door was locked, it didn't open, but it was clear that someone was trying to get in. My heart raced, but after that single attempt, everything went silent again. Eventually, I fell asleep. The next morning, I told Max what I'd heard, and we shared the story with his parents. His dad searched the property again, but found no sign of anyone. My mom picked me up later that morning. I stayed over at Max's house a few more times after that, but nothing like this ever happened again. 
Years ago, when I was 14, I had a crazy experience during a sleepover. My best friend Ryan was coming over to hang out and spend the night. It was a weekend, and my sister was staying at her friend's house. Meanwhile, my parents were home earlier, but had gone out for the night, leaving Ryan and me alone at the house. We were playing video games in my room, which was what we typically did when hanging out. After a while, I heard a knock at the front door. We paused the game and walked down the hallway to the front door. I looked out the window first and saw a woman standing on the front step. She looked somewhat young and had short, dark hair. I didn't recognize her at all, but I decided to answer the door. The woman told us that her car had broken down and she needed help. When I asked what kind of help, she said she wanted us to come over and look at her car. Neither Ryan nor I knew anything about cars, so I told her I wouldn't be much help and suggested she call a mechanic. She insisted, still asking us to come and take a look. I didn't see her car, but I assumed it was somewhere down the street. As a kid without even a license, I knew I wouldn't be any help. I asked her what exactly was wrong with her car, thinking maybe it was something simple like a flat tire. She said she didn't know, but that the engine wouldn't start. I explained again that we couldn't help her and suggested she find someone else who could. The entire situation gave me a bad feeling, but eventually, the woman said okay and walked off. Ryan and I went back to my room and resumed playing video games. After a while, I left the room and passed by the front window. That's when I saw the same woman again. She was back, walking through our front yard. I stopped to watch where she was going. She didn't seem to notice me, but I saw her leave the yard and head back into the street. My uneasy feeling about her hadn't gone away. I thought she might go to the neighbors' houses to ask for help, but I let it go and returned to my room. About an hour later, as Ryan and I were still playing games, we both noticed movement in the backyard. Looking closer, we saw that the woman was now walking through the yard. I couldn't believe she was back yet again. We paused the game and went to the window to watch her. She was heading toward the backside of the house, possibly toward the back door. I cracked open the window and yelled, asking what she was doing. The woman froze, then turned to look at us. She repeated that her car was broken down and asked if we could help her. This time, she started walking toward the window where we were. When she reached the window, she asked again if we could come out and help with her car. I told her no, again, and firmly asked her to leave the yard. She didn't move. I then told her that if she didn't leave, I would call the police and they could assist her. At that, the woman's demeanor changed. She angrily yelled, no. When I asked why not, she suddenly made a fist and punched the window hard. Ryan and I both jumped back in shock. After hitting the window, the woman turned and sprinted out of the yard as fast as she could. Ryan and I ran to the front of the house and watched her disappear down the street and out of sight. We called the police right away and explained everything that had happened. They said they would look for the woman. After they left, my parents came home. We told them what had happened, but there were no more incidents that night. Ryan stayed over, and we didn't see or hear from the woman again. I sometimes wonder if she even had a car, or if her plan was to lure us outside. To this day, I don't know where she came from or where she went. The whole situation was incredibly strange. When I was 12 years old, I went to a sleepover at my best friend Julia's house. I arrived in the afternoon, and in the early evening, we decided to go to a nearby park. The park was only a few blocks away, within walking distance of her house. It would take less than 10 minutes to get there along the sidewalks. Julia and I both played softball, so we went to the park to practice. When we got there, we were the only ones at the park. It had a single softball field, a few benches, a large open area of grass, and some scattered trees. The park was surrounded by the residential neighborhood. We started playing catch and practicing fielding. About 45 minutes into being there, only a few people had passed by, mostly people walking their dogs. 
Then, we noticed a man who walked into the park. He was wearing sunglasses and sat down on a bench not far from the softball field. At first, we didn't think much of it and continued practicing. I didn't look at him for a long time, but after 30 or 45 minutes, he was still sitting there, just watching us. By then, we were about done with our practice. We gathered our things and started walking back to Julia's house. To leave the park, we had to pass by the man since his bench was next to the walking path. As we walked past, he got up and started following us. We could hear his footsteps about 30 or 40 feet behind. Neither of us said anything at first, but when we turned onto another block and he was still behind us, it became clear that we both felt uneasy. Julia suggested we take a different route home to try and lose him. At the end of the street, we turned right instead of going straight. Then, we turned right again at the next block. After a little while, I stopped hearing his footsteps, and when we looked back, we didn't see him anymore. To be safe, we looped around the block before heading back to Julia Street. Once we got there, the man was nowhere in sight, and we quickly went inside her house. That night, we hung out in Julia's room, talking and laughing. I had my sleeping bag with me since I was staying the night. We stayed up pretty late, and by midnight, everyone else in the house was asleep. Julia's bedroom was at the front of the house. Her blinds were closed, but at one point, she got up to look out the window. Suddenly, she said, that creepy guy is outside. At first, I thought she was joking, but when she kept looking, I got up to check for myself. Sure enough, the man was there, standing on the sidewalk in front of Julia's yard. He was still wearing sunglasses and was looking around. We wondered what he was doing, but then he looked toward the window and seemed to notice us. We both ducked down immediately. After a few moments, Julia carefully peeked out again, just barely lifting the blinds. That's when she said, he's coming into the yard. We both panicked and ran out of the room into the hallway. Julia woke up her parents while I stayed in the hallway, too scared to look outside again. I didn't hear any knocking at the door or other noises, so I wasn't sure where the man was. A few minutes later, Julia's dad went outside to look for him, but by then, the man was gone. We considered calling the police, but since he didn't come back, we decided not to. For the rest of the night, there were no more incidents, and neither of us ever saw him again. But thinking back to that night still gives me chills. One time when I was younger, I had a sleepover with four of my friends. We had a close friend group and hung out all the time. This particular night, we were at Riley's house, which was pretty big and really nice. What I remember most about the night happened pretty late. We were all hanging out and talking past midnight. Riley's family, including his parents, had already gone to bed upstairs, leaving us downstairs in the living room where we'd be sleeping. At some point, the front doorbell rang. It immediately caught all our attention, and the conversation we were having stopped dead. For a few seconds, there was complete silence. Then we started talking all at once, wondering who it could be. Riley stood up and began walking toward the front door, which was on the other side of the house. Naturally, the rest of us followed him. When we got there, Riley looked through the peephole and then opened the door. He said nobody was there. We all crowded around and looked outside. Sure enough, whoever had rung the bell was gone. Riley even stepped outside to check, but nothing seemed unusual. Eventually, we went back to the living room, and the conversation shifted to who might have rung the doorbell. Some of us thought it might be another friend pranking us. After another 10 or 20 minutes, the doorbell rang again. This time, all five of us jumped up and rushed to the front door. Once again, nobody was there. Riley opened the door, and this time, we all went outside to check. We searched the front yard, looked into the street, and even went around to the backyard. After a thorough inspection, we still couldn't find anything or anyone. We went back inside, slightly unnerved, but starting to think it might be a harmless prank. 
Back in the living room, we tried to move on, but the strange events lingered in the back of our minds. About 10 or 20 minutes later, we heard another noise, but it wasn't the doorbell this time. It was the sound of the front door opening. We froze, realizing in horror that when we had come back inside earlier, someone must have forgotten to lock the door. That meant whoever had been ringing the doorbell was now inside the house. We were too far from the stairs to go up to the bedrooms, but we were near the stairs leading to the basement. Without saying a word, all five of us bolted downstairs. In the basement, we hid wherever we could find space. It no longer felt like a harmless prank. It was really late at night, and the idea that someone had actually entered the house was terrifying. For what felt like forever, we stayed completely silent, barely even breathing. After about 10 minutes, we started whispering to each other, trying to figure out what to do. After some time, we decided to carefully go back upstairs, to check. We moved slowly and cautiously, listening for any sounds, but the house was eerily quiet. When we reached the main floor, there was no sign of anyone. We checked every room and even went upstairs, to Riley's parents' floor. Nobody was there. It seemed whoever had entered, had already left. We locked all the doors, double-checking them this time, and went back to the living room. There were no more strange noises or doorbell rings for the rest of the night. Eventually, we all fell asleep, though it took a while to calm down. The next morning, we talked about what had happened and searched the house again, just to be sure. We didn't find anything, and the mystery of who was ringing the bell and entered the house remained unsolved. To this day, my friends and I still talk about that night. None of us have any idea who it was or what they wanted. It's one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to us. Thanks for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed the story, don't forget to give the video a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a terrifying tale. See you in the next one.